Hey, Dave, I'm glad you could make it. Sure, no problem. As a matter of fact, I had a meeting to go to in about an hour just up the road. Uh, now, your phone message said that you were having a cover problem? Yeah, I was going to spray like I usually do, but I thought it might be a good time to try another approach. You know, I've been hearing a lot of talk about nematodes. What can you tell me about them? Well, as a matter of fact, that's what we're going to talk about in that meeting later on today. So I even have some over here in the truck. What would you like to know about them? Well, for one thing, I wonder if they really work. And if I do decide to use them, what do I need to know? Well, the nematodes are one of those biological control success stories. Now, they don't work all the time against all the insects, but heck, neither do your chemical insecticides. You know, for cutworms, yeah, I'd give them a shot. It can certainly reduce the amount of chemicals you use. Let's go take a look at that cutworm problem. Sounds great. They're out on number 11. Hey, let me know when you got to get out of here, okay? Oh, sure will. You know, I've had that problem now for about two or three months. Many growers have long relied on broad-spectrum chemical pesticides to combat pest problems. Those chemicals are effective, but they can lead to a cycle known as the pesticide treadmill. Now, here's how that treadmill works. Pesticides are applied to kill pests, but they also often kill insects' natural enemies. Because of that, when new pests enter the area, they encounter few or no natural enemies. Pests often reestablish themselves quickly, and that forces growers to make more and more pesticide applications. The pesticide treadmill is in full swing. In an attempt to get off this treadmill, scientists are studying the complex ecology of biological control agents. Such an understanding is helping growers reduce their reliance on chemical insecticides. The aim of this integrated pest management concept is to efficiently marry biological and chemical controls into an IPM system. To implement IPM, the biological control agents, whether they are nematodes or some other biological control, must be both effective against the pest and compatible with chemicals that are used. I'm glad you're interested in using the nematodes. For the last 30 years or so, we relied way too heavily on chemical pesticides, and we're beginning to pay the price. Yeah, I've noticed that some of the things we've been using for years sometimes just don't seem to do the trick anymore. Yeah, you rely on one thing too much, and that's what happens. The pests become resistant to it. And with chemical controls, there's always some risk to the environment. That's why we're really encouraging people to use more biological controls whenever practical. Yeah, I don't like to use any more chemicals than I have to. And now I'm getting some pressure from the Greens Committee to make sure we're as environmentally friendly as possible. So I guess it's time to start looking at some new things. Mm -hmm. All right, here we are at number 11. And here's that soapy water treatment you showed me last year. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what you can learn from your local entomologist. You know, this really doesn't look all that bad. OK, here's one of our worst infestations. Boy, this is cutworm damage, all right. You can see right here where they've done their feeding. They do a lot of this type of feeding at nighttime. You think there's a nematode product that could take care of all this? Oh, I think it's worth a shot. I've seen the nematodes really do some pretty amazing things. Hey, Mark, would you like to see some of the nematodes? I brought some with me to show the people at the meeting this afternoon. Some of them haven't seen them before. Sure, that sounds great. Are they in your truck? Yeah, let's go. Nematodes appear to be one of the most effective biological controls available to growers today. The citrus, nursery, and greenhouse industries have seen great success in using them along with other control agents. The strawberry, cranberry, and turf industries are beginning to see just how effective nematodes can be against soil inhabiting pests. However, some kinds of nematodes are pests themselves, and nematodes are everywhere. In general, nematodes can be thought of as the round worms. They're the non-segmented worms that we think about. And uh, they inhabit all niches in the world, really, uh, at least for the most part. There's an old saying that uh, if you were to take all of the matter and remove it from the world, you'd still see a, a vague outline of all of the, uh, the, the material things in the world because of their complement of, of nematodes. Nematodes can cause plant disease and, in fact, a great deal of crop loss throughout the world. But certain nematodes called entomopathogenic or insect parasitic nematodes have a great deal of commercial possibility to actually help growers fight pests. Insect parasitic nematodes work effectively against soil insect pests under the right situations. 
They're not a panacea for insect control. Uh, in terms of uh, having the right conditions, you need good moisture, uh, good temperature situations, uh, and uh, insect has to be at the right stage. And under those kinds of conditions, the insect parasitic nematodes can be quite effective. Experts agree that nematodes aren't the be-all and end-all to fight any pest, but they can be a good component of an IPM program, especially where soil pests are concerned. Dave, you left your truck running. <laughs> yeah, on a hot day like today, it's wise to leave the air conditioning on. You know, my general rule of thumb is, if it's too hot to keep a dog in the car, it's too hot for the nematodes. You know, it's hard to believe that there are small living worms in this thing. I know what you mean, but there are. We really have to be careful to make sure that they stay alive so that we, they can do the job that we need them to do. How do they work, anyway? Well, basically, they're parasites. And once they get inside of the cutworm, the nematode releases a bacterium that finishes the cutworm off. And that bacterium also preserves the cutworm. And then the nematodes feed on the bacteria, and so do their offspring. <laughs> Man, do they actually go out and hunt down the cutworm? Well, some do, and some don't. The nematodes are basically classified as ambushers or cruisers, though some of them have a little bit of behavior of both. Ambushers or cruisers? Yeah, you know, like cruise missiles. I can explain while we mix some of these up and get a closer look at them. Is that OK? Sounds great. I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about it, actually. Different types of nematodes work better against different types of pests. Nematodes that adopt more of an ambusher behavior, such as Steinernema carpocapsi and Steinernema scapteriski, are most effective against pests that roam around the soil. They patiently wait, standing on their tail in a rigid position, and latch onto their host as it passes nearby. Nematodes that are classified as cruisers such as Steinernema glaceri and Heterorhabditis bacteriophora are more mobile. They seek out their host by sensing volatile compounds, such as carbon dioxide, that their hosts release naturally. Still other insect parasitic nematodes, such as Steinernema feltii and Steinernema reobravis, take an intermediate approach. These differences are very important in determining what kind of nematode can fight specific soil pests. Cruisers, for example, are especially good at attacking more sedentary pests, which are more likely to be in the soil. Ambushers are better at attacking pests that move around more and are more likely up on the soil surface. In either case, once the nematode finds its prey in the soil, it enters the pest by way of spiracles or insect orifices. Once inside, the nematode releases bacteria, and the insect is killed within 48 hours. In the meantime, the nematode feeds on the bacteria and develops into an adult. Within a few days, its life cycle is complete, and hundreds of thousands of new nematodes emerge from the cadaver of the insect, beginning their own search for new hosts. Not all nematodes use the same type of bacteria. Nematodes in the Heterorhabditis genus use bacteria called Photorhabdis, which turns the insect cadaver red within a day or two after infection. It also has a luminescence gene, so cadavers actually grow in the dark. Bacteria that work with nematodes in the Steinernema genus aren't so flashy. They turn the cadavers brown or tan. And with either nematode, only cutworms, citrus weevil larvae, or other insect pests are susceptible to the infection of this biological control agent. Hey, you're right. You can see these things moving around. Oh, sure you can. If they don't move, they might not be alive. But that's not always true. Now, the ones that you're going to be using against the black cutworms are your basic couch potatoes. And I usually take a probe or something like this and move them around and see if they react. You mean to see if they're still alive? Yeah, basically. Hmm. I think I'm going to order some of these. What kind should I get? Well, it says right here in our brochure that uh, for cutworms, you ought to be using uh, the Steinernema carpocapsi. I'll go ahead and order some right now. Sounds great. Hey, I've got to get to that regional meeting on biocontrol. 
We're going to talk a lot about the nematodes there. Great. When I'm ready to apply these things, I'll give you a call. Okay. Hey, help me pack this stuff up so I can leave. Nematodes have been mass-produced for insect control since the early 1980s. Some companies produce them using live insects, emulating conditions in the wild. Other companies use fermenters as large as 30,000 gallons. However they're produced, manufacturers test the nematodes to confirm that they are alive and can kill insects. Then they're packaged and shipped, sometimes in liquid formulation, sometimes on sponge, and sometimes as granules to be dissolved in water by the grower. Although the granules are dry, the nematodes are still alive. You get that product fresh from the factory and use it within a few days. You, you've got to be ready to use it when it comes in. When at all possible, it's uh, not a bad idea to be able to look at your product before you put it out. Nematodes can be stored several weeks to several months, and that includes distribution time. Although they can be fragile, they've been used worldwide since their introduction against many different types of soil inhabiting pests. In Japan, nematodes are used against the hunting billbug on golf courses. In China, they're used to fight the peach borer. In Europe, the black vine weevil and mushroom fly are combated with nematodes. In Canada, nematodes fight caterpillars and the root weevil. In the United States, nematodes are used against white grubs, mole crickets, fungus gnats, the artichoke plume moth, and citrus weevil. Anywhere in the world, nematodes need to be well matched against the right pests. For example, mushroom flies and fungus gnats are best controlled by Steinernema feltii. Bill bugs, black cupworms, sod webworms, fleas, and mint root borer are best controlled by Steinernema carpocapsi. Black vine weevil, strawberry root weevil, and cranberry girdler, all major pests in the cranberry and strawberry industries, go up against Steinernema carpocapsi and Heterorhabditis species. Two other nematodes, Steinernema scapteriski and Steinernema rio bravis, are two of the nematode industry's success stories. Mole crickets, for example, have caused tremendous damage in pastures and golf courses throughout the South since some of the more powerful and polluting chemical pesticides have been taken off the market. In our search for some sort of a biological control method, mechanism, we had a postdoc do some searching in South America for any biological control organism he could find, and lo and behold, he found a nematode that we believe is keeping mole cricket populations under very good control in South America. So we brought that to Florida and have released it, and in small plots, it has done a fantastic job of keeping mole cricket populations under very good control. We went back to some plots after eight years, and we discovered after that length of time, with only the original application of nematodes that we were getting up to 40 percent infection of mole crickets that we trapped and in some cases mole crickets were so scarce we were not trapping very many at all. The mole cricket is just one nematode success story. Citrus groves in Florida have a major pest, the citrus weevil that feeds on tree roots. Luckily Steinernema rio bravis is a very effective tool against the weevil, or rather its larvae. But it wasn't the first nematode to be tried against the weevil. Well, a diaprepes is uh, an exotic species to Florida. It was introduced in 1964. So we've had 30 years of it spreading throughout the state. And uh, at least the last time I checked, it was uh, infesting 20 counties that grow commercial citrus uh, and infested approximately 50,000 acres. Uh, we've seen the infestation develop over a period of about 15, 10 to 15 years in our groves. Uh, initially, we noticed some trees were declining, but we weren't exactly sure why. Over the next five to eight years, we began to realize that there was an, uh, an insect occurring here, and then we had some 
researchers from the experiment station come out and confirm that it was the diprepes root weevil. And it's moving out more acreage all the time. And um, it's um, just an unbelievable problem that we, we've never faced anything like it uh, yet. And it, and it doesn't, it just seems like it doesn't make a difference what the rootstocks are, it gets them, different rootstocks. And uh, it, it's a, just a very, very devastating uh, thing to happen to you. When citrus weevils first became a problem, powerful insecticides were able to deal with them. In the 1970s, the Environmental Protection Agency started to ban the use of chlorinated hydrocarbons. Biological controls were gaining favor too. Research into the possible use of nematodes increased. At first, researchers thought one type of nematode, Steinernema carpocapsi, was the best match against the citrus weevil. It didn't work as well as they hoped. But now, Steinernema reobravis seems to be doing the trick. The early failure, though, caused pessimism to breed about the promise of nematodes. No, we didn't start with the right nematode, unfortunately, and there are a lot of uh, pessimists. And I think today, where we are, we can now say that, yes, we may have had the wrong nematode in the past, but today we certainly have one that's, that's uh, much, much better, more efficient. And uh, that's why I'm optimistic about believing that maybe in the future we'll even get better than we are now. The hard data with Steiner Nema Rio Bravis speak for themselves. Uh, I didn't have real high hopes that we were going to see uh, good efficacy against this diprepes uh, root weevil. Uh, with field applications, we reduced the population densities of the weevils in the field uh, by a considerable amount. With, within our own data, we're showing about 90% reduction in that particular experiment. Nematodes can't fight all pests in all crops, and they need careful handling to ensure they're strong enough to do their job. But they have become one of the most effective biological controls available to growers today. The key to using insect parasitic nematodes is learning all you can about them before applying them. So as you can see, this website should really help keep you up to date on what the research says about using nematodes to combat soil pests. Dave, glad you could join us. Hi, Jim. Sorry I'm late. I had to help a golf course superintendent. That's no problem. We just got started. Did you uh, bring those nematodes? Yeah, I have some right here. I'll get some out so that we can see them a little later. OK, great. Well, let's get back to the website. Now, I'm surfing live today, so it may be a little bit slower than we'd like it to be. But I think you can at least get an idea of how things are organized. For instance, here you've got the background on the biology and ecology of nematodes. And there's basic information on how nematodes fit into biological control. And here's a really nice section. You can get step-by-step -step instructions on how to use insect parasitic nematodes. And information on specific industries is located down here. I see you've got a home and garden section, too. I know some people who'd be interested in that. Sure. I see a lot of ads for nematodes from garden centers. And you can check out this page and tell your clientele on how to use them. You know, I've got some tomato growers in my area who'd like to try nematodes against tomato hornworms. Is that going to work? Well, those are caterpillars on tomato leaves, right? No, nematodes really don't work against foliage-feeding pests. They require a lot of moisture, or they'll die quickly. And they're also very sensitive to ultraviolet light, sunlight. So, no, they really wouldn't work against the hornworms. Uh, I guess I've got a lot to learn. You know, what you might want to do is to check out the biology and ecology section on the website and just review the basics. You can get some real good information there. It'll bring you up to date. That's the one really nice thing about the web. You can update information continuously. I've got some skeptics who don't believe nematodes will work. Is there any information showing success rates? Dave, you've worked on this. What can you tell us? <laughs> well, you know and I know that nothing is 100% effective all the time. And you've got to be careful on how you apply the nematodes. Otherwise, they just won't be effective. But yeah, there's information on how successful these nematodes have been, especially on those sites, turf and nursery, strawberries, and cranberries. Now, if you've got a question, you can also click right there and ask the expert panel. They're the people that put together this website. That's great. I'm glad to see you have cranberries up there, too. Do nematodes have effective control in cranberry bogs? 
Yeah, cranberry bogs are good environments for nematodes because the soil is moist. And both uh, the Steiner nemocarpocapsi as well as the heterorhabditis species are especially good at combating the black vine weevil grub. You know, black vine weevils are sometimes a problem for strawberry growers in my area. And they'll work against them in that particular environment. You just have to apply them correctly. Now, it seems to me a lot of the nematodes I've heard about are used on turf grass pests. Yeah, you're right. And that's really something we should talk about. Now, just think about it. Turf grass is a vital part of our sustainable landscapes, but it often receives more pesticides per acre than does farmland. Now, as you can see here, nematode products are available to control most turf insect pests. Your cutworms, armyworms, webworms, mole crickets, billbugs, and maybe even white grubs. Now, how many of our clients would benefit from using nematodes? Probably all of them. But it's important to remember, just as you have to choose the correct chemical insecticide to be effective against a target insect, you also have to choose the right nematode to go against a target insect. Well, now let's take a look at one. Now, Dave, you helped with the uh, turf section on this thing. Yeah, this is a good example. The ambusher nematode, Steiner nema carpocapsi, really doesn't move around much in the soil. So it would be a poor choice for an equally sedentary pest like the white grub. However, it's an excellent match against cutworms and other surface insect pests. Selecting the right kind of nematodes is one of the most important things to remember. Now remember, these are alive. They're living, breathing animals. There are some special application procedures that you have to follow. You just can't apply the nematodes willy-nilly and hope for the best. You know, Dave, this might be a good time to take a look at those nematodes you brought. Hmm? What's there to see? Well, you can actually see them moving, and that's one of the procedures that Jim mentioned. You really need to check the product before you apply it to make sure the nematodes are alive. Nematodes do appear small, but their size is still a concern during spray application. Although microscopic, they could clog screens and spray nozzles, so the screens should be removed before application begins. After mixing the formulated nematodes in water, According to the label directions, the nematodes can be applied using conventional spray equipment, including small pressure sprayers, large spray rigs, and even irrigation systems or hose end sprayers work well. The tank or container holding the nematodes should be agitated during the spraying to prevent the nematodes from settling to the bottom. Also, apply the nematodes immediately don't let them sit in the container indefinitely. And avoid applications when soil temperatures are low, since few nematodes can kill insects when the soil is too cool. Since the nematodes have no impact on humans or wildlife, no special precautions or protective clothing is needed. After application, water the area again to help the nematodes enter the soil. That's especially important when applying nematodes to turf grass. On turf, nematodes are more exposed to sunlight. Irrigating within 30 minutes after application helps them work their way into the soil and away from the sun's harmful rays. Oh, hey, Dave. Thanks for stopping by. Sure. Got those nematodes just about a half hour ago, and I've got them mixed into the solution. Mm -hmm. Do I just dump them into the tank? Sure. Go at it. Hey, Kevin, go ahead and put them in. Now, remember that these are living animals, and I hope you've cleaned out the spray tank. There's a set of insecticides and fungicides that can adversely affect them. As a matter of fact, they're even listed right here on the label. Yeah, I cleaned out the sprayer yesterday, that uh, triple rinse thing, just in case. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Okay, now they're in the tank. Do I just spray them onto the green? Uh, well, wait a second. Let's check and make sure they're okay. Okay, but what could have happened? Well, lots of things. Length the time of storage, excessive heat, contaminants, things like that. But it's really easy to check here. What we need to do is take a hand lens here. And, ah, yeah. Here, you take a look. Wow, they are moving. That's neat. How much are they magnified here? Now, that's a 10x hand lens. They look awfully small to kill a cutworm. <laughs> now, size doesn't make a difference here. However, we can certainly help them out if we irrigate right after they've been applied. Now, I hope your assistant is out there ready to help you. Yeah, Randy's at the switch box. He'll turn on the irrigation head just as soon as I finish spraying each green. 
I'll radio them each time. Great. I'm going to go do some sampling out on the course. Okay. Randy, this is Mark, over. Randy here, over. I just finished on five and heading to number six, over. Yeah, I'm turning the irrigation on for number five right now. Hey, Dave, I'm just finishing up here. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't wait until tomorrow morning and seeing all those dead bugs around here. Well, you're just not going to see that. Well, I always do when I treat for cutworms. It's not pretty, but I must say it's satisfying. Yeah, the nematodes, though, don't affect the cutworms that way. Now, chemical pesticides irritate the cutworms, and it's that irritation that forces them up to the surface. The nematodes kill the cutworms in their burrows, and they just don't come up. Oh, okay, so how will I know if these things are working? Well, you're going to have to go back and check your greens in another couple of days to see if the damage spots are disappearing. Now, if they're not, you'll have to use that soap flushing technique that I taught you about last summer. Ah, uh, okay, I get it. I keep forgetting that this isn't really a pesticide. You know, I don't think the golfers will miss those dead bugs on the greens. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I got to head back to the shop. Okay, I got to finish up here. Okay. When applied properly, insect parasitic nematodes can help control many types of soil insect pests, and they can be used easily. Well, the nematodes fit in very easily with most of the agrochemical application systems. Almost everything that you can use to apply chemicals, you can use to apply nematodes with also. So the nematodes can be applied cheaply, conveniently, and with existing spray equipment common on many farms. While nematodes hold a lot of promise, they could use some help. They often don't have the force that chemical pesticides pack, but they can be used in combination with many types of chemical products. Some fungicides and fertilizers can be mixed with the nematodes and applied together. Whenever nematodes are used, they must be handled with care. First, don't store nematodes at temperatures certain to inactivate or kill them. Nematodes can't withstand temperature extremes. Overall, nematodes don't store well, so it's best to use them the same day as you purchase them or within a day or two at most, as long as they're stored in the refrigerator. The only exception, nematodes in granular formulations, they can be stored for a few months. We do two things to check this out. We take a sample after we put them into the tank. Uh, we keep the tank churning, and then we spray the field, and then a double check. We come along afterwards, and we also examine them again to make sure that uh, they are still viable. It may take more care and technique to use nematodes, but this is offset by the absence of toxic residues, bird kills, groundwater contamination, resistance, chemical trespass, or need for protective clothing. They're so safe, they do not need to be registered with the EPA, making them an excellent IPM option for high activity areas. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Looks like you're catching up on some paperwork there. By the way, how did those nematodes work on your cutworm problem this last summer? Here, take a look. I only used a little pesticide this year, nothing compared to what I had been using. To get this kind of control, this is great. Even though you kept on telling me that nematodes require a special amount of attention to become effective, it sure is nice not to have to worry about the precautions I had to take with some of the stuff we were spraying. That's a good point. Hey, do you know anything about nematodes for grub control? Well, as a matter of fact, some of the nematodes that we've been testing in our turf plots have been working very well, but they're just not commercially available yet. I'll let you know if they ever get on the market. Better yet, what you might do is check out that website that we talked about. Yeah, I've got it bookmarked. Hey, you're going to have to excuse me. There's a head of our greens committee who just pulled up. He always wants to know about our pest control. He's really ecology-oriented. You need some help? Nah, I think I can handle it. I appreciate all your help, though. Okay. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Good, Mark. Glad we could get together and take a look at the greens. Hey, I read in the newsletter you're spraying some kind of bug to control cutworm. Yeah, hop in. I'll tell you all about it. Actually, they're called nematodes. We started using them last year. In the early 1980s, just a handful of scientists understood the potential of nematodes for controlling insects. Today, nematodes play a supporting role 
in controlling many soil insect pests. The use of nematodes will continue to expand as further technological advances are made and more users understand how best to use this new weapon against soil pests.